of the one seminar series uh, of the Italian Society of Statistical Physics before, before the summer. I mean, uh, we will restart the series uh, starting from September. And today we have uh, two talks, one from uh, Ilaria Paga and the other from uh, Mattia Radice. We will start with Ilaria. Ilaria graduated from La Sapienza University of Rome and she is currently doing a joint PhD uh, between La Sapienza and Universidad Complutense de Madrid. Her supervisors are Enzo Marinari and Victor Martin Mayor, and, her, uh, and, her, uh, research, uh, and the research project of her thesis is focused on the numerical uh, characterization of spin glass systems in different geometries. And uh, uh, Ilaria will discuss her PhD thesis in a couple of weeks. So she's very close to completing the PhD. Please, uh, Ilaria. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Thanks for the, the, the kind, kind presentation. I'm going to, uh, to share my, my slides. Okay. Do you see them? Yes, yes. Okay. Now it's full screen. Yes, please. Okay, thank you again. I will, will start uh, by thanking the organizer to give me the opportunity to speak about my work. And today I want to speak about a, joint, um, a new scaling law that describes the spin glass response in theory experiment and simulation. This work it was done in collaboration with the experimental group of Houston, chief by Prof. Orbach and the Janus collaboration. As you know, the Janus collaboration is a project between uh, different universities uh, in between Italy and Spain to, uh, build, to, to build up a supercomputer which are uh, specifically designed for uh, simulation for simulate Edward Anderson models. Here a sketch about the, the talk. I will just give you a short introduction about what is a spin glass system and why they are so interesting. Then I'm going to introduce the dynamical, the, the problem that we wanted to solve in this joint, pro, in this, this joint paper, because we are inter interested in, in trying to understand how to describe the dynamical arrest that happen in glass formers at or below the critical temperature, and just give you some details about the experiments and the simulation. And then I just go straight to the results, because I want to show you the experimental, the numerical results, and some sketch about the new the calculation of a new scaling law for describing the, this dynamical arrest. And so, uh, a spin glass is a really peculiar type of glass. It's random and uh, is a mixture of interactive magnetic systems that experience a random freezing of spins below some critical temperature. In particular, what is, uh, uh, is really interesting about uh, spin glasses is that uh, the spins frozen in some random direction, but if we are looking uh, the uh, total at uh, the te temporal average over the system, we cannot uh, detect uh, the order pattern. We can see only if we are looking at the microscopic configuration. The standard model that we use for describing this kind of system is the Edward Anderson model, where, uh, for example, in a cubic, uh, cubic, uh, cubic lattice, uh, we put at each node a uh, spins, and uh, the, here you can see the, uh, the Hamiltonian of the, of the system, where the spins in, in our cases is just uh, the easing one, and so it would be up and down. And the um, interaction matrix J, XY is a, is a quench disorder and uh, is just a mixture of uh, antiferromagnetic and ferromagnetic interaction between all the first neighbors. We, uh, we know that uh, the spin glass system actually has a, a thermodynamical phase transition at the critical temperature Tg and uh, is an explanation to the to, is, the, is the reason for, for, for which the, the, the spins are frozen in some direction. What makes interesting of spin glass system is a, a combination of uh, disorder and frustration. This, the, the frustr uh, we, we, we define it that a system is frustrated 
when it's not possible so that to satisfy all the links uh, at the same moment. For example, if we take an elementary uh, plaquette, that is the, easy, the simplest element to describe a graph or, or, a, 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 or a system, if a plaquette has an odd number of negative interactions, that means uh, an antiferromagnetic interaction between spins, and so the spins uh, try to be in the opposite uh, direction in order to satisfy the links, it's not, there is no possibility to, uh, to satisfy all the links. For example, in this case, we, uh, which the, wherever we put the spin, the fourth spin up or down, we are not. Uh, it's not possible so that to satisfy all the links because uh, the plus interaction means that the spins, the the links, uh, is a ferromagnetic, and so the spins try to be aligned in the same direction. Otherwise, it would be in the opposite one, and so uh, the frustration is when uh, it's not possible to satisfy all these links, and uh, one. Uh, what follows from uh, this uh, frustration is a degeneracy in the energy. In particular, if we are looking at the free energy uh, using a cartoon physics, as I show, uh, I'm, I'm showing here in the slide, if we are plotting the free energy or system has a, a function of one possible configuration coordinates, we see that the system, the, 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 the spin glass, has a really rugged landscape where there are many valleys which are, some ones are metastable, and each valley is separated by uh, a large free energy barrier. In the thermodynamical limits, this barrier is going to infinity, and so we are trapped, you know, or we can just explore one small part of the uh, free energy space. Uh, the spin glass are interesting not only from a physical point of view, but even uh, because uh, it, it can be uh, useful, uh, it can be, uh, can be uh, um, uh, it, it can be possible to uh, relate the spin glass, uh, spin glass uh, theory to uh, computer science because uh, try to find the ground state of such complex system or such complex landscape is an incomplete uh, computational problem. However, we need to find a way to describe a free, a free, a such complex free energy landscape, and the usual. We usually use, uh, we work in terms of uh, the Edward Anderson overlap or the parameter. That is uh, a square. It's a, a square average over the time of uh, over the, the the configuration of the spins. And uh, what the, the information that gives us the, this overlap uh, parameter is that when uh, the system, when the spins are frozen, this uh, quantity is different than zero and, uh, of course, positive because it's given from a uh, square. Otherwise, if we are in paramagnetic phase and so the spins are completely correlated uh, one from the, other, from the others, this quantity is just equal to zero. Moreover, it's possible to uh, compute this, uh, the Edward Anderson model exploding the, uh, replica, uh, the replicas. That means that we can clone the system in, uh, with, under the same coupling condition and just try to evolve, to evolve them uh, independently. And so we can play this game, we can calculate the configuration, of the, we can calculate actually the configuration between uh, two independent replica, but uh, this, uh, this uh, Edward Anderson overlap uh, parameter is possible only to, it's possible to calculate only from a numerical point of view. In the moment that we want to work with the experimentalists, we need to find a, a, different, uh, a different way to uh, formalize uh, the, the spin glass uh, 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 observables. In fact, uh, in the lab, uh, usually they are working, uh, they, they are evaluating uh, the magnetic response of a system. And so what we did in this joint uh, paper, it was exactly, exactly this. So we evaluated uh, numerically in, uh, in, in the experiments, the experimental protocol of the zero field cooling. This protocol consists in taking a sample from a very high temperature, that means uh, that means that the spins are completely decorrelated each other. Then, with a finite cooling rate, we bring the system to the working temperature that, in our case, is below the critical one. Uh, we let the system relax for a time at the waiting, and after this time, 
we turn on the magnetic field and start to recover the magnetization. And the main quantity that is uh, analyzed in uh, the experiments is the relaxation function, or in other words, the uh, time derivative of the magnetization. And here I reported a typical set of relaxation function found in the Houston lab. As you can see, the peak of the relaxation function is not uh, always at the same position, but it is going on the, le on, uh, on the left uh, as increasing the magnetic field, the external magnetic field. And here is uh, the order of the, of the magnetic field that uh, is possible to, uh, that uh, they, are, they are performed in uh, the Houston lab. As you know, this P, the, the, relation, the relaxation function has a peak and uh, the time at which it peaks is called effective time. And this effective time is really important because we can connect the effective time to the maximum of the, of the free energy through our own Arrhenius representation. Excluding again the cartoon physics that I introduced uh, in the previous slides, we see that uh, if we are, uh, a valley is separated by a uh, free energy barrier that are in uh, this case I call it the delta max, and we can connect the delta max to the uh, effective time. In addition, we know that in presence of an, an external magnetic field, the Zeeman effect lowers these barriers by an amount proportional to the square of each, to, uh, the square of each and to the uh, correlated spin. Here, for simplicity, I just write the dependence from the uh, correlation length, where d is the dimension, so in our case, uh, d is, is equal to 3, and theta is uh, the replicon. And so, it's combining these two equations, we can, uh, actually, we can uh, obtain a relationship that connects the effective time, that is a quantity that is possible to calculate from uh, an experimental point of view, to the, uh, the microscopic structure of our spins. And this, uh, this approach was introduced for the first time by John and his collaborator at the end of 90. However, what they, were, they found uh, in the labs, because it's uh, an experimental group, it was uh, that it's clear that it's not enough <laughs> To, uh, to describe, it's not enough, uh, this, uh, this approach for describing uh, the, uh, the effective time all around, uh, all around uh, the magnetic field. As you can see here, it's clear that there is a, a, a departure from the linear slope for really is, uh, for, uh, in, um, in the large magnetic field region. As you can see here, we, it's okay, the linear slope, but here, here it's clear that it's not correct. And so our goal, is exactly try to, to figure out and to draw out a new scaling law that is capable to describe the effective the, the behavior of the effective time all over the magnetic field. And so now I'm going to, to the results. I'm going to show you the, the experimental results and then the numerical one. Because uh, in particular, what I want to focus is that uh, from a numerical point of view, it was really hard at the beginning to um, to calculate the same observable that are uh, easily, easily achievable in the labs. However, in the experiments, the Houston groups perform uh, great experiments. In particular, the success of their approach was to be, to, to can access to the small magnetic field region that it was impossible in the, in the past. Here I compare the, uh, the previous results by John, his collaborator, and the new experimental data that, as you can see, is, is uh, uh, give us access to this area that it wasn't uh, possible before. And uh, what is clear is that the departure from a linear slope is not present only for, for large magnetic field, but even for in uh, the smaller region. As you can see here, it's clear that it's not possible to describe this data only, just, only by, um, through a linear, um, a linear slope. Here you can see is, uh, the, the zoom of uh, the experimental data. I want to underline that the uh, critical, the temperature 
uh, to which they, they perform the experiments is below the critical one. In the experiments for this kind of glass is around 32, and so we are below, but uh, quite, but, but close, close to it. And in particular, I want even to underline the huge correlation lengths lens that uh, they could uh, achieve experimentally. And you can find the details in this paper that just appeared this year. Parallel to these experiments, we perform with uh, the Janus collaboration, we carry on a massive computer simulation on the Easy End or Anderson model, where the coupling is just an, a random mixture of ferromagnetic and ferromagnetic uh, interaction. The spins are just plus, the spins could be just up and down. However, we have, there are some problems. Before to start in the simulation, we have some problem because we know that there is a, a mapping between the magnetic field in the in the lab, and the magnetic film, the, the magnetic field in uh, in, the, in in Janus units, and the relation is quite unfair from a numerical point of view because one unit in Janus roughly corresponds to fifty thousand oyster, and uh, as I showed you before, as I showed you before. A typical set of magnetic field that is used in the lab is around 50 or even less, and so we needed to figure out a way to uh, perform a simulation where we are looking at a, a compatible physical scenario. In addiction, we can't uh, simulate the magnetic field that is smaller than this quantity because there is the signal to noise uh, limitation. Of course, in, if I'm here to speaking about uh, this joint paper, we figure out and we found the solution. And the solution was given by the features of Polisky relaxation that allows us to connect the reduced temperature in a simulation and in the experiment uh, to the magnetic field. In this way, working with a higher temperature than the one it was supposed in the experiments, we can uh, completely absorb the huge fact, the huge conversion factor between the magnetic field in simulation and experiments. Thanks to this, we was able we perform uh, six different simulations. Uh, the temperature is 0 0.9 and the temperature 1.0. I remember you that in, in, uh, in the Janus units, the critical temperature is uh, at 1.109, and so we are below the critical temperature, but uh, close to it. And we perform with different uh, within time. Of course, uh, there are some differences between uh, the simulation and the uh, experimental protocol. First of all, in the, in the experiments, they are working with a finite cooling rate to predict the system from a very high temperature to the working temperature. Instead, in simulation, the quench is instantaneous, and so we mimic uh, the zero field pool is the protocol taking a random initial random config, configuration that uh, is a typical configuration at high, uh, very uh, high temperature. Then we uh, instantaneous we quench, we we did a, a instantaneous quench to the working temperature. We let the system relax for a time t waiting. Here you can see we uh, simulated six different waiting time. And after this waiting time, we turn on the magnetic field and start to recover the magnetization and the correlation lengths. It was hard to, from an American point of view, it was hard to calculate this quantity because, uh, as I told you before, the relaxation function is uh, the derivative of the magnetization. And the relative error of the magnetization is growing as the inverse of the magnetic field. And so for small magnetic field, that is actually where we are most more interesting to evaluate the effective time, more uh, is fluctuating the magnetization. And this is a disaster if we want to calculate the numerical derivation of the magnetization. However, with a, a a bit of work, a bit of regularization, and magnetization, and here in this paper you can find all the technical details, we uh, obtain these uh, clear uh, curves. As you can see, the peak is well defined for small magnetic field, but is ch and, uh, uh, exactly as in the experiments, is changing uh, in the moment that we are increasing the magnetic field, the, the, peak, the peak is, uh, is going on the left. Moreover, as you can see, for example, uh, in this case where we uh, have a, a quite large uh, waiting time uh, for this temperature, there is uh, the, part, the problem that uh, when the magnetic field, and so the non-linear magnetic, uh, uh, non-linear interaction, um, no, sorry, 
the non-linear uh, magnetic effect increasing, we see that the, the peak is going to, uh, to vanish. And so this is really hard to extract the effective time from this data. We can do from a very, for the small uh, magnetic field, but it's hard for the other cases. And so we, uh, we, um, we found a solution changing our point of view. Instead of studying the relaxation function as a function of the time, we studied as a function of the, the, the correlation function that is defined in this way that it gives us information about the time evolution of the correlation speeds. And a really interesting scenario is appearing. As you can see, the peak is always at the same, at the same point. It's not changing or moving when the magnetic field is increasing or when the nonlinear magnetic effects are, are stronger. It, we have always the problem of the vanishing of the, the physical peak. Here you can see there are two peaks, but this one is just a spurious effect in the moment that we turn on the magnetic field. And so this is a, a, a response of the Monte Carlo, but it, it doesn't have any sense. The physical peaks which we are interested to evaluate the effective time is from as this one. And so looking at this data, we uh, we introduce a new definition for the effective time. And so the effective time is uh, the time we define as uh, the time at which the correlation function achieve a constant value that we call the C peak. Uh, and this equation, this new definition for the effective time is a huge numerical simplification for uh, three reasons. First of all, because uh, we don't need anymore to regular, to work with the magnetization, because uh, we can have access, directly access to this quantity from numerical simulation. And we don't need, uh, and so we don't need uh, anymore to regularize the data in order to build uh, the relaxation function. Second, because uh, we can calculate with high precision the effective time for all the cases, uh, for all the different magnetic fields, even for the stronger one. And third, third, because we can evaluate the effective time even for a, a zero magnetic field, that it was impossible in the previous work that tried to understand, to figure out how to extract the effective time, it was impossible to calculate in the limit of H equals zero, because of course, if we don't have an external magnetic field, the system, can, we can calculate the relaxation function because the system doesn't have a magnetic response. But with this new definition of effective time, we can do it. And so this uh, represents a huge simplification from a numerical point of view. The last ingredient that I wanted to introduce before to conclude my talk is the new scaling loop. Because now I introduce and show you the experimental and numerical results, results in order to extract the effective time. But the, the, the starting point is that uh, we are missing that was missing a, a good estimator for describing the, uh, the behavior of the effective time all, ar all along the uh, magnetic field. And so we assume that the equilibrium scaling theory for the magnetization holds as well in an equilibrium regime. And so we can write the scaling, the equilibrium scaling theory, theory uh, introducing the time dependence. And so we can connect the magnetization to the correlation lengths. And here we have a scaling that depends on the magnetic field, the external magnetic field, the correlation, and to the, the ratio of the correlation, the starting correlation lengths and the evolution of the correlation lengths. Since we are in a full aging regime, we can neglect this term because it will be of order one. And so we have just this part, we have just the dependence of the correlation lengths and the scaling is just a function, a singular function of this variable. Then independently, we can always tailor expand the magnetization for small magnetic field, introducing the susceptibility at each order. And combining these two equations, we can uh, obtain this equation that connect the susceptibility at each order to the correlation lengths. However, what uh, we notice from this uh, calculation is that if we are calculating the uh, first order of the susceptibility, we are uh, we obtain a paradoxical results because in the thermodynamic limits, if c is going to infinity, x one x going to uh, k one sorry is going to zero, 
And of course, this is not possible. And so what we are, we are, we are missing in this, uh, in this calculation is the, regular, the contribution of the regular, regular part of the free energy, because this scaling, it just gives us information about the singular part of the free energy. And so we correct we introduce this, the, the contribution, the regular part, and we write here the, in this way the, the key one uh, uh, value, where this term is, uh, I don't want to give you all uh, the, the, the technical details that you can find uh, in uh, both these, uh, these, are these papers, but the, this it came from uh, the fluctuation dissipation theorem, and it gives us information about the regular part of the free energy. And so with a bit of algebra, we can calculate the free energy just by integrating the magnetization and with a, a, some uh, formulas that I don't want to, go, to give you too much uh, in details, we uh, obtain a new scaling law for describing the, uh, the behavior of the effective time. The main contribution is that, uh, of course, there is a scaling function of this uh, Zeeman energy that is exactly the same uh, introduced by John and his collaborator at the end of 90. But uh, we introduce a, a correction by a correction, a correction that depends on the correlation lens. And, uh, and the first term here is given information about the regular part. And the plot that uh, I'm showing you. Uh, um, uh, told us that uh, both the experimental and numerical results are well defined and well described by this uh, scaling law, where of course A2 is just a short way to uh, define the regular part of this, this term here. And uh, the last things before to, to, con to, to conclude is that, uh, of course, there are some uh, discrepancies in the experimental data, but uh, in the experiment, is it really hard to, to, this data doesn't have error bars, and so we don't know actually which is the confidence of this, this point. Uh, otherwise, in the numerics that we can replicate the system, and so we can calculate with high precision all the quantities that uh, in which we are interested. We see that the scaling is, uh, is, is holding for all the regime. And so, in conclusion, thanks to a high quality simulation carried on the supercomputer Genesis 2, careful experiments capable of addressing the relevant regime of very large correlation lengths close to the glass temperature and extension to the non equilibrium context of the classical equilibrium scaling theory, we solve a three decades problem concerning the nature of the Zeeman energy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the talk. Uh, are there questions or comments? Uh, I, <coughs> I have a question. I, I mean, you compare uh, experiments uh, and uh, and the specific model of spin glasses, right? I mean, uh, is there any criticality in, uh, let's say, in comparing uh, a specific empirical system and uh, one model? Or just, I mean, uh, the comparison is, is straightforward. No, the, this is one of the results that we obtained, that if we simulate a really easy Egger-Anderson model, at the end we can compare and it works exactly in the same way in a, a, of an extra, of an, a, a real sample. Mm -hmm. And so we, in the paper that uh, I showed you before, we compare even other uh, experimental data according to the new scaling law, and uh, we obtain uh, a good agreement with the scaling. And so this is one of the main uh, results about uh, this uh, fruitful collaboration. So the approach of the, I mean, the, 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 the quantity that you are monitoring uh, are pretty general with respect to some, let's say, sp specific realization of spin glasses. Is that correct? <laughs> Yeah, is that, yeah, this is correct. In particular, the, the progress of this joint paper is that uh, for the first, we usually, from a numerical point of view, we work with the replica world, in the replica world. 
instead in the moment we want to collaborate with experiments so we need to uh, figure out and to calculate the effective time of the relaxation function some are observable that are uh, really hard for sometimes to calculate from a numerical point of view and so is uh, i think it's a success that we can uh, speak with experiments in terms of the correlation lengths, in terms of the effective time, and uh, it's pretty general, everything. Okay, thank you.